guys. Man, we have a great crowd. Good to see everyone. Uh, sorry I missed you last week. Uh, I'm sure you missed me, right? I'm sure you, boy, that was convincing. Oh, yeah. Um, so, but thankful for Kyle for being here. If you were here, not here last week, uh, we had a missions thing at church. And so uh, I had to kind of be there for that. Um, and uh, Kyle Anson, who uh, was a former youth pastor as well, and a uh, church planner now, uh, came and, and preached for us. But anyways, I'm sure you enjoyed that. Um, how many of you would would say um, you have people-pleasing tendencies? In other words, you like to please people. I mean, you're kind of a people player. <laughs> no, no, no pointing at other people, okay? Matthew, no pointing at anybody else in the back. Um, but some of us do. I, I'm, I, you know, and I'll go over it. You, so here's how you know you might be a people pleaser. And this does have some relevance to the message later, so hopefully a little bit more anyways. But uh, it says you can never say no because you don't want to offend anybody, right? You don't want to, you know, you, you kind of say yes to everything. You can't take criticism. You don't take it very well. You don't, uh, even constructive criticism is tough to take. Um, he, this says you're just flat out, you're a liar. Um, now, let me explain what that means. Uh, even though you may never admit it, you're not honest about who you are. Uh, so you're, because you, you want to please other people. You just say, yeah, I, I can do that. Um, my coach one time in, in college said, Darren, you ever played first base? And I said, yeah, I used to play it all the time. I never played first base, you know, but uh, I, I was a people pleaser and I wanted to play. So um, you hate confrontation, uh, guilty. Yeah, I don't like confrontation. So uh, you are embarrassed by your actual taste in anything. I don't really know what that means, really, but uh, like from movies to music or books. Um, anyways, sometimes that that's a, um, I don't know, maybe that's not you. Uh, I'm not really, obviously, look at me, I'm not really embarrassed by what I wear. Um, you are extra nice to people that you actively dislike. But you, you're, you're nice to them anyways. Like, I'm, I'm always nice to Patrick. <laughs> Uh, but no, I'm just kidding. I'm thankful to, for Patrick. He's a good friend. He is a good friend. So uh, a people pleaser is one of the nicest, most helpful people, but they can never say no, right? We have trouble saying no. And so one of the things we're going to look at tonight is, is, is what does that mean to be a people pleaser? When I was younger, I wanted so badly to please other people, uh, to be, please my parents. I was just a people pleaser. I, I didn't, I didn't get into a lot of trouble, and, because, and it wasn't because I was a saint of a kid. Uh, it, there was a couple different reasons. One, because I was just, I, I didn't get caught as much as I should have. Um, so I still made poor choices. I made mistakes. I just didn't always get caught. But I, I just, I also, I was petrified of not not doing the wrong thing, but getting caught for doing the wrong thing. Okay, I didn't want to disappoint my parents, especially my dad. Well, well, especially my mom. I didn't want to get in trouble with my dad because my dad. I knew what my dad would do. I would disappoint my mom, and I just that was. I mean, that was the end for me. If I disappoint, if I thought my mom was disappointed with me, man, that's all she had to. You know, I just I was I would crumble under that. So I wanted to please people, and and again, I rarely got in trouble, but it wasn't because I didn't do anything wrong. I just had this deep desire uh, to to please others, and as I got older, oddly enough, that that became even stronger in my life. Um, I kind of moved away from home, went off to college, uh, did all those things. I, I just, uh, it became even a stronger um, desire for me. And I told you a couple weeks ago, now I'm 50 and I don't even care anymore, right? I mean, I don't care what people think. And, and that's not totally true. That, that's, that's, that was, I was kind of laying it on a little thick there. That's not completely true. I've still, I've gotten better at it. Uh, I like to refer to the fact that I'm a recovering people pleaser. That's what I say. I'm, I'm a recovering people pleaser. I still have some tendencies to, to go that way. Uh, and maybe you do too. Um, and, and there's not anything inherently wrong with that. Um, Except for where do we place that in, uh, you know, where, how much, how much inf uh, energy do we put in that pleasing others as opposed to pleasing God? So if you've been with us for the last few weeks, we've been looking at the Enneagram, which is not a, it's not a spiritual thing. It's a secular um, uh, personality type of profile test. And we went through, do you have those, Heather, the, the nine? So here's the, 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 the uh, just our type. So the first one was the 
reformer uh, that we looked at or um, uh, there's another word for the perfectionist reformer, the perfectionist. We looked at that. Uh, then type two is the helper. Uh, type three, which is where we'll be tonight, is the achiever. Uh, type four is the individual. We're just going over this real quick because we didn't, uh, Kyle didn't preach on this last week. Four is the individualist. Five is the investigator. Uh, six is the loyalist. You're a very loyal person. Seven is the enthusiast. Eight is the challenger. And nine is the peacemaker. Now you may look at that and you think, well, I could, I could probably be all of those. I have a tendency to do all of those. And you know what? You probably do um, have some of traits from all of that. And as we look deeper in each one, we'll, we'll see that. Now, um, this is not, let me just say this, okay? Here's why we, we, we are studying this. Number one, because your generation, the, the millennials and even younger, um, this is, the Enneagram is something that's just taken it by storm. I mean, it's it, if you know anything, you probably used it in college. Uh, my oldest son came home from college. I told you this. He's like, Dad, you guys got to take this test, you know, a couple years ago. And I'm like, what, what to do? I fail it? Can I fail this test? I'm not taking it. it. You know, I don't, I don't want to take a test that I can fail. And it's, it's a personality profile thing. So it's a secular uh, tool. However, there's some spiritual connotations to it as, as we dig deeper into it. So we're not going to look at it from the secular side. We're going to look at what does the Bible mean by that? Or, or how can we use if, for example, if you're a reformer, what does that mean biblically speaking? Okay. So, um, so that's really our, our, and, and, and here's why. We went back and we said, remember in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, I think, we said, it says that you're created in the image of God. We all are created in the image of God. So it's important that we know, number one, it's important we know that. We are all created in the image of God. But not only that, in Psalm 139, verse 14, he says, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. We are all made in the image of God, but we also are all made uniquely, okay? There's uniqueness. We don't all look the same. We don't all act the same. We don't all have the same personalities, right? So, and, and that's a good thing. Because, man, if everybody was like me, this would be a really boring place to live, right? Nobody wanted to be around that. I wouldn't want to be around that. I, I like being around other people that aren't like me. Because usually they're fun, and I'm not. I'm not all that fun. But so, so we, we, it takes all of us to know our personality types. It takes all of us as we are a body of Christ, not just in this, but, but I mean globally, the body of Christ takes all of us and all of our personalities to be all that, uh, to, to be all that God has saved us to be and created us to be. So it takes everybody, right? So it's important that we know our personality, not so we just know what makes us tick, but so that we know what God intends for us and created for us. Now let me say this. Knowing your personality, and as we go through this study, the rest of the nine weeks as we go through this, knowing your, your type, and know, because in the book, uh, The Road Back to You, is, is an excellent book, and I would recommend this to anyone reading it. It kind of, it goes through and it gives more detail on, on some strengths and weaknesses of each number and what they're prone to do and what they're prone not to do. And, but it also has a spiritual connotation to it as well, what, what makes it important spiritually. But let me just tell you this. Just because you know your type, say you, you're a type two or type one or whatever, and you know the weaknesses that we talked about. In fact, we said type one's a reformer. Um, sometimes, um, you know, they, they have some weaknesses as well. And we're going to look at some weaknesses tonight with the achiever. But just because you know that, it doesn't give you an excuse to use that to be disobedient to what God has called you to do. Okay. Don't, don't, don't mix that up. Don't, don't. When I say some things that, that the book points out that, well, the, the reformer has a tendency to, to be a little critical, and so we, we can't just say, well, that's just the way God made me that way, and that's just who I am. Yes, that is who you are, but that's not an excuse to not do what God is calling you to do, Right? It doesn't give us an excuse to sin, and it doesn't give us as an excuse to just chalk it up to say, you know, that's, that's who I am, uh, and I can't do anything about that. Yes, you can. We can do things about that. 
we can get closer to the Lord and, and draw closer to Him in Scripture and help. Hopefully, so the point is this: is not just to know our personalities, but the point is this: is yes, to know our personalities. But how can we, in spite of our weaknesses, and we all have weaknesses, in, in spite of our tendencies that we struggle with, and we all have those. How do we use those to become a more committed follower of Christ? You see, that's, that's the key that I hope that all of us, that we're gonna, and all of us, me, including myself, w when I first took the test, uh, and I didn't fail it, by the way, um, when I first took the free test online um, that Stephen gave, it, it showed that I was an achiever. And I thought, I don't, see, I don't get that. I don't see that I have those tendencies. I don't believe I'm an achiever. What does that, you know, what does that mean, an achiever? So then I, as I read it some more, I realized that, yeah, I, I see that. And here are some, with this book, and again, this is not the gospel here, okay? This is just this, personal, this person's opinion on some, lots of research. But here are some traits of uh, what, he said, what it's like to be a three. It's important for me to, be, to come across as a I'm kind of guilty of that. I don't, I, don't, I don't connect with every one of these, so I'm just going to read the ones that, that I connect with. The keys to my happiness are efficiency, productivity, and being acknowledged as the best. Now, I can tell you that I, I don't really always want to be front and center, even though I like to preach and, and, and that's what I do, but I, I don't always have to be the center of attention. That's not really me. But, but can I just, just bear, you know, just be gut honest with you, in the back of my mind, I still sometimes, yeah, I, I kind of do want acknowledgement for things that I do. I may not say that, even though I just did. Uh, in the back of my mind, I've all, I've, I'm kind of thinking that. And, and I feel guilty for thinking that. And that's part of the achiever as well. Uh, I don't like it when people slow me down, so don't slow me down. I don't like that. Uh, you know, if I say we need to be somewhere in a certain time, we're going to be there. I'd rather lead than follow any day. Mostly that's me. I'm a, I am competitive to a fault. I don't play golf very much um, because I, I'm, I'm too competitive and I'm not good enough at golf. And I should be better than I am now. So I get mad and angry out playing. It's, it's not relaxing. Some people play golf because it's relaxing. It's not relaxing for me because I'm too competitive and I'm just not good enough. So um, I find a way to win over and connect with just about anyone. I, I, I I struggle with that sometimes, but anyways, I keep a close watch on how people are responding to me in the moment. I'll be honest, it does matter to me how people are responding to me. If they're sleeping in the message, then I know what's going on. Like Calvin back there, he's, he's out. Um, it's hard for me to not take work along on vacation. I kind of do that. Uh, it's hard for me to access my feelings, to, to name or access my feelings, to share, you know, my feelings openly. Uh, I love setting and accomplishing measurable goals. I told you I'm not a, I'm not a, um, um, oh, what do we, the, what do we, uh, the first of the year, what do we call it, uh, the, what? Resolutions, thank you. Like it's ten people said it at once. I didn't know what they were saying. Uh, resolutions. I don't always set resolutions, but I love setting goals. I'm a goal setter. I have goals written out all the time, uh, and and I, I strive for those. Um, let's see. I like, and I have a question mark by this one, but really it's true. It's 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 me, and I, and I hate to admit it, but uh, I like other people to know about my accomplishments. Now, can I just say, I feel uncomfortable when people acknowledge it. I do. Um, when people call me up or whatever, and they, they talk about my accomplishments or whatever, I don't feel very comfortable. But if, they, if I didn't, if I wasn't acknowledged in the first place, then I would be upset. You may not know that I'm upset, but in my mind, I'm upset. Well, they didn't even know I was here. Um... I like to be seen in the company of successful people, so if you hang out with me, just it's because I think you're successful. Um, and I don't mind, now this, 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 this is the last one I'll read, but um, I, let me explain it after I read it. I don't mind cutting corners if it gets a job done more efficiently. Now what I mean by that is, and I don't know if this is what this is, he's implying, but I don't wanna do things 
um, I, I won't. I don't like to do anything unethical or immoral or anything to cut corn. That's not what I'm talking about. But uh, you know, I've told you before, like putting things together and instruction, reading instructions. Forget it. I don't. You know, I'll read the first page or two, and then I'll throw those things away, and I'll just start doing. I'll cut corners if I just to get so I can get it get the job done. Right now, it's not done as well, more than likely because I didn't read all the instructions, and I've got lots of parts left over, and I don't have no idea what to do with them. Right. So. Uh, so that's kind of that's and that's who I am. That's a, that's a three. So we looked the last couple weeks. Let me just rehash it just briefly. The reformer or perfectionist. We said that they would stand for anything, and Paul was a reformer more than likely. Now we don't know this for a fact, but but based on biblical evidence and his writings, Paul was more than likely a reformer. He stood for people that he didn't even know. He stood up for people that he had never met. We saw that in one of his writings that we looked at that week. Uh, and we, we saw that he, he uh, a reformer likes to educate or mentor, invest in other people. That's what they do. They, they spend their time. But they're also not, a, not afraid to call out other people. If they're doing something wrong, they will hold them accountable. They'll call them out. Then two weeks after, or the week after that, we looked at type two and the helper. And we said that apostle, the apostle John was more than likely a helper. Based on what we know of John and from his writings, he appears to be. Now, there's, not, there's more than one example, obviously, but he's the one we chose to, well, not you didn't, but I chose to speak on that week. You, I didn't give you a choice. Um, but we, he said if a helper finds joy when others succeed. They find joy when others get, you know, get, find success. They praise others for their faithfulness. But again, they speak the truth in love. And I said my wife was, was a, a two. She's a helper. I've never met an advocate for, for children, and not just for children, but for children's parents. Especially those that are, um, would fall under a special needs. Man, she is an advocate for those parents. Because she knows that those parents don't always understand their rights. And she will go to bat for them. Because she's a helper. That's what she likes to do. That's what fuels her. And maybe you're the same way. Maybe that's what you are. So let's talk about the type three. Or the, the book calls type three uh, the achiever or the performer. Achievers, they strive for success. They constantly create goals. They tend to want to impress others with their accomplishments or their, their achievements. They tend to want other, even though sometimes they feel uncomfortable with recognition, like I said, I, you know, in, in my mind, I like it, but in front of people, I don't always, I don't know how to respond when I get recognized. I still want the recognition, but I don't always know how to, how to respond to it. So they're successful oriented, they're success oriented, but they're, and they're afraid of failure. They're afraid of not getting a job done. They're afraid of, what if I'm not enough? What if I'm not good enough? What if I'm not creative enough? What am I not whatever enough? There's always a fear of failure. And listen, this can be true for lots of different types, not just for the achiever, okay? So it may be true for other, other, other types that we will look at as the week goes on. Can I just be honest? I thought that um, this would be an easy message to prepare for me because I'm a three. Um, I'm, I'm a hard three. Uh, and I, but it really wasn't an easy, because I didn't, it, it got real with me. I mean, I got, I, I, I just got, it just, it stepped on my own toes quite a bit in many places that we're going to look at tonight. So, um, I read you some of the things, but one of the, in the book, it says one of the biggest weaknesses that a three has, in fact, the book has sections for each type, and they call them their deadly sin. Now, he, he says in there, this, it's not like a deadly sin, but they're, the biggest thing they, they struggle with, and number threes, the type threes, the biggest thing they struggle with is dece deception. And it's not necessarily deceiving others, it's deceiving ourselves. You know, I, I tell myself, and it can be good or bad. I've never been happy with who I am, so I want to be somebody else. And, and before long, I start thinking like I'm, you know, well, I'm telling myself this enough. I'm going to start acting like this other person. I deceive myself. But it can be go the other way, too. It can go the other way where I think, well, I'm not good enough. I'm not this enough. I can't do that. Well, God created me to do something. So I'm taking God out of the equation and I'm thinking, I'm not good enough to do what God has called me to do. I'm deceiving myself. 
Okay? So it can go both ways there. So we're going to look at a, um, a person who more than likely uh, was a type 3. There were a couple different examples. Um, and, and we're going to do it a little differently tonight. We're going to look at what a healthy 3 would be and an unhealthy. That's what the book pulls out mostly is uh, here's what a healthy 3 does and here's what an unhealthy 3 does. Okay? So we're going to look at the story of Jacob. A couple different places in the Old Testament in the book of Genesis. Pretty easy to find. First book in the Bible. Uh, so if you, if you have your Bible, if you have a scripture with you, we're going to look at uh, Genesis 25, verses 24 through 34. Uh, and we're going to do a lot of reading tonight. And you know how I am with reading. Sometimes I struggle. I put words in there that aren't supposed to be there. And I, you know, I don't know why I do that, but I've done that my whole life. So uh, just bear with me. So verse, uh, chapter 25, this is the birth of Esau and, and, and Jacob. Uh, I, um, Isaac was their father. Okay, so this is their birth and, and they're twins. And so here's, after they are born, here's, here's, uh, here's what happens. Verse 24, when the days to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red with uh, all of his body like a hairy cloak. That's an attractive baby, isn't it? <laughs> Just a full of red all over the place. I don't know. Not that there's anything about red. If you have red hair, I'm sorry. I didn't mean that. But they just, their body's full of hair like a hairy cloak. So they called his name Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's heel. So automatically, we see some form of personality of, 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 um, of Jacob, right? He's holding on for dear life. He's wanting to be first. So his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. Can I just say to you, I am 50. I can't imagine having children at 50, let alone 60. But anyways, it was a different day. Uh, when the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter. Uh, the man, uh, he was a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man dwelling in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he ate of the game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. So, uh, so Jacob was a mama's boy. And so was I. I was a mama's boy. I just, I just was. Um, then verse 29. Once when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came in from the field and he was exhausted. And Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stew. I'm exhausted. Therefore, his name was called Edom. Jacob said, sell me your birthright now. Now, this is, this is important. Uh, Esau said, I am about to die. And you, and of uh, what? Of what good use is my birthright to me? Jacob said, swear to me now. So he swore him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then he, Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Now, here's, here's what's important here. Number one, health and achiever. Okay, here's what you need to know. Number one, the healthy threes are authentic. They're, they're real. They're who they are, right? They're just, they're good with who they are. They're authentic when they're in a healthy position. When they're unhealthy, they tend to be deceptive. Did you see what he was doing? He was deceiving his brother into selling him his birthright. Now, the birthright was a very big deal in this day and time. Uh, the firstborn, especially if it was a firstborn son, uh, they, they had most, if not all, of the rights. They were given most, if not all, of the rights to the land, all of the things that the family owned. Uh, they, had every, they were given lots of, of, they were given a blessing from the father. So the firstborn, uh, especially if it was a male, they had, I mean, they, they had a lot to lose. Esau, uh, Jacob, wanted that so badly, he, he deceived his brother out of it. And then it says Esau just despised it after that. You see, Esau, we could look at him too, and he was, he was just, he was not patient. That's probably another number that we'll have to look at. I don't know. But he wasn't patient at all. He, all he could think about was food. He thought he was dying, and he needed food. And Jacob deceived him out of what his birthright and all of his inheritance. Look at the, Proverbs chapter 10, verse 9 says, Whoever walks in integrity walks securely, but he who makes his way crooked will be found out. You see, Jacob began this life. We're going to see in just a minute that this was something that was um, more than likely just a part of Jacob's character. And they, even his family knew this about him. And we'll read that in just a second. So, but, but, so the, Jacob was, was not walking straight. He was, at this moment, he was an unhealthy three. 
he was deceiving someone and, and the, the person he was deceiving was his brother. He wasn't being authentic at all. Unhealthy threes tend to be deceptive. They tend to deceive other people. They don't, they don't, they don't tend to be genuine or authentic. They don't like who they are and they want what other people have. Jacob was, was maybe embarrassed. I don't know. I'm, I, I hope I'm not looking too much into the text here that's not there, but maybe he was a little embarrassed because Esau was a man of the, of the woods. He was, a man, he was a hunter. We already saw that. And, and Jacob was, was a quiet person and stayed at home and cooked. And there's nothing wrong with that. But in that day and time, it probably was looked upon as he was less of a man than Esau. And that could have played a, a heavy burden on him that he probably put on himself. So he deceives, not just himself, he deceives his brother, saying, hey, give me your birthright and I'll give you whatever you want. Unhealthy threes, healthy threes are authentic. Unhealthy threes are, tend to be deceptive. Now flip over Genesis 27, verses 18 through 26. Here's another the second point we'll look at. So, so um, this is when uh, Jacob and they, they're getting a little older uh, and Jacob um, uh, goes to his, his mother and uh, his brother Esau is again out hunting. And remember, Rebecca loved Jacob more than she loved Esau. Uh, and so she sends his, him, Jacob, into their father, uh, Isaac, who, who is on his deathbed or very nearly close to dying. And here's where we pick up the story. So he, Jacob went into his father and said, my father, and he said, Jacob, and Isaac says, here I am, who are you, my son? Well, he says, who are you? Are you my son? Basically, there's a question mark there. Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. This gets better as we read. Uh, I am, I am, uh, <clears throat> He says, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Now sit up and eat of the game. So Jacob tells Esau to go out and get the food and prepare for him because he wants a meal. Uh, and so he's out getting, trying to hunt. And, and so Rebecca, the, the mom, sends, uh, knows that, that Esau is gone. So she sends Jacob in to impersonate and try to deceive uh, Jacob, their father, or uh, Isaac, their father. So Jacob does that. But Isaac said to his son, how is it that you have found it so quickly, my son? He answered, because the Lord, the God, the Lord your God granted my, me success. Then Isaac said to Jacob, please come near that I may feel you, my son, to know whether you are really my son Esau or not. Now that's, that's an indicator right there. That's a clear indicator that we'll come back to in just a second. So Jacob went near to Isaac, his father, who left him, and he said, my vo the voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother's Esau hands. So he blessed him. He said to him, are you really my son Esau? And he answered, I am. Uh, verse 25, then he said, bring it near to me that I may eat of my son's game and bless you. So he thought he brought it near to him and he ate and, and brought him wine and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, come near and kiss me, my son. So he came near and kissed him, and Isaac smelled the, sun, the garments and blessed him. So basically, here's what happened. Uh, Rebecca puts all of this hair, kind of glues, sticks all this hair onto Jacob to make him look and appear like Esau. And, and Jacob, who, uh, Isaac, I'm sorry, who is blind as a bat, doesn't know who it is, and he smells him, and he, th and he feels of the fur, and he thinks this has got to be Esau. So when he, when he sees, look, th this is something, obviously this is nothing new. Because in verse 21, he says, And Isaac said to Jacob, Please come near that I may feel you, my son, to know whether you are really my son Esau or not. That shows me that Isaac probably had some indication of who Jacob really was. So secondly, a healthy three is driven to succeed. They're driven by, they want success, not in a bad way, but they're driven to be, to, to accomplish something. They're driven to succeed. But when they're unhealthy, 
they will do anything to get it. Even deceiving their own father by dressing up like their brother or whomever they need to and lying about who they are and going in. They're driven to succeed and there's nothing wrong with having that drive to be successful as long as we keep it in the right perspective of godly perspectives and what he wants for our lives. They're driven to succeed but when, it, when they're unhealthy they will do whatever it takes to get there. And that's what Jacob did. He did whatever it took. Um, and obviously, this is, like I said, he had the reputation of doing this. If we looked again at and then in verse 22, so Jacob went near Isaac, his father, who felt him and said, the voice is Jacob's voice. The voice is Jacob's, but the hands are the hands of Esau. Isaac knew. He had some inclination of who Jacob really was when he was unhealthy in his, in his attitude and his perspective of himself. When he was not growing in his relationship with the Lord, when he was not seeking God, he was, that's when we are unhealthy and we tend to do things that are just detrimental to our faith. And that's what Isaac was doing. That's what Jacob, I'm sorry, was doing. Man, I've been getting these names mixed up all night long. I apologize. James 4, 17 says this, So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Think about that. Do you think that Jacob knew what he was doing was wrong? Sure he did. But it sure didn't stop him, did it? Now later on in his life, he pays for that greatly. And he and Esau have a falling out, obviously. And Jacob runs for his life for a number of years. And then towards the end of, of the story of the two brothers, they do kind of have a, have, have, have reconcile. But Jacob still fears Esau. He's still fearful because he knows what he did was wrong. He knew what he did was wrong but he chose to do it anyways. Why? Because he was in an unhealthy situation. He was in an unhealthy relationship with the Lord. And when we're healthy, we're driven to succeed. But when we are unhealthy, we will cheat to get there. We know it's wrong, but we do it anyway. And again, remember what I said at the beginning. This Enneagram that we talk about, it's not an excuse to, for you to just be sinful, to just act upon your sinful um, uh, desires, because we all have them. We all have things that 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 are we are areas of our weaknesses. That we all have as as what I think Hebrews talks about that sin that easily entangles us. We all deal with that. Now it's not the same. Sin, your sin, your your desires are not the same as mine, and mine are not the same as some of you. So so it may be all different, but we all have something that we struggle with. Some of us have some things that we struggle with, right? And the Enneagram, just because we know that personality type is in us, it doesn't give us an excuse to just follow that and say, well, that's just the way God made me, so I gotta live that way. No, that's not, that's not right. We are created in the image of God. And yes, we are born in a sinful world, so we have a sinful nature, but it doesn't mean that it's right for us to just willingly, knowingly commit sin. Because James just tells us whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, it doesn't matter if that's your personality or not. You fail to do the right thing and you know what is right, but you fail to do it, it's sin for you. You've committed sin. That's what Jacob did. He knew what was right and wrong, but he disobeyed anyways because that was more important to him. Then number three, healthy threes value pleasing God. An unhealthy three, all they really want to do is please others. When we're in a healthy situation, when we're in a healthy relationship with God, all we want to do is please God. We want, to, we want to do things that please Him, not so that He will love us more. That's not how God works. It's just so that when, because we love Him, uh, we, and we love because He first loved us, but when we love Him, we want to serve Him, and, and that's what our goal is. We want to serve Him, but when we are unhealthy, we are more concerned with what other people think than what God thinks. 
And let me tell you something, I, this, this part hit home for me because for most of my life, I would tell you that I was a Christian. I was saved when I was 10 years old. I was baptized November 11th, 19, oh gosh, 1979. Um, I'm, you're, I know you're thinking, was there color back then? Yes, there was color TV back then. We didn't have one, but uh, there was color TV back then. But if, since that time, all through my teenage years, I, was, I would have told you, yes, I was a Christian. I believed. I had a relationship with Christ. But I wasn't pursuing him. I was an unhealthy believer. I was unhealthy in my relationship with Christ. Because my relationship with Christ, while it grew, and, and, I, and, and I answered that call on, his, on my life when, he, and when I knew, I know for a fact he spoke to me and saved me. I know for a fact. But that's really where my, my growing in my relationship stopped for a while, for a long, for a long season in my life. Why? Because I was driven by other things, not bad things, but they became bad things because I put them in front of my relationship with God. I put them in, in front of my pursuing Christ. I pursued things of the world. Not bad things of the world necessarily, but what made them bad is what made them gods, little g gods in my life was because they were the most important thing to me. And listen, there's not anybody in this room, and I'm not a prophet, I don't know everybody's deal, I don't know what everybody's going through, but there's not anybody in this room who hasn't done the same thing at different times in their life, right? We've all struggled, that's just something I think we all struggle with from time to time, putting something, and it may be a good thing, but if it's put in front of our relationship with Christ, then it becomes an idol, and it almost becomes like a little g God in our life. We may, it may struggle admitting it, because we don't like to admit it. But we're so concerned with what others think sometimes. This are, I'm talking about threes. Those of you that are threes like I am. We're so concerned what others think that we neglect to pursue Christ. And, and to not worry but be concerned with what he thinks and what he is doing in our lives. So instead of pleasing God, we seek to please others. Now, there's nothing wrong with pleasing other people. But it becomes wrong when that is our goal. When that is our main goal. Well, that is the thing that drives us. That's the issue. That's where it becomes an issue in our lives. That cannot be our main priority. It can't. What has to, what has to be first is our relationship and our pursuit of Christ. Let me read one last passage to you. And this again is written from Paul, who was an expert on lots of, lots of this. Colossians chapter 3 says this, Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Whatever you do, work with all your heart, all your might as for the Lord. Do it all for God. Whatever you do. You're like, well, what does God call me to do? I don't know, but whatever it is, you just do it to try to glorify God. And then he says this, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. You are serving the Lord Christ. Whatever it is that God has called you to do, do it to glorify him. Not to please other people, but to glorify him. That's, that's tough. Because we all like to have, you know, we all like to, to be complimented or we all like to have some recognition for doing a good job. And I don't think there's necessarily anything wrong with that in and of itself. As just as long as we keep it in perspective, right? It's all about our perspectives. It's all about what is most important to us. It's all about what is the thing that drives us most. 
Is it that we want to please God? And not because we're fear, afraid that God would not love us anymore. We just want to pursue Him and know Him more. Or is what drives us that we want to please other people or we, we worry too much about what other people think about us. Can I just tell you, and I know I joked about it earlier, that I'm a recovering people pleaser and I've still got a way to go. And I'm a lot older than anybody else in this room. Well, most people in the room. And I'm still, I'm a work in progress. I haven't gotten there yet. Uh, but I'm, I'm moving towards that. I'm moving forward, I think. Finally, I'm moving forward in the right direction. Don't give up pursuing Christ. Don't give up just because you hear your, what are some weaknesses in your, in your personality type. Don't, don't, don't allow that to weigh you down and give up. Paul says later in his writings, you were running so well. What happened? What, what happened? How, what got you off track? Don't get off track. I, life happens, right? Life happens. I get it. Things happen and, and, and it catches you by surprise. How many of you were caught by, the, by surprise by the news today? Kobe Bryant. I mean, I mean that, that just came out of the blue. If you're not, uh, if you haven't heard, Kobe Bryant was killed in a helicopter crash today. And I mean, it's just out of the blue. Life happens. It just does. Negative things happen in our lives, and they catch us by surprise. But it doesn't give us an excuse to not be who God has called us to be, and, to, and to, it doesn't give us the excuse to, to, to use these negative influences in our life or these, these negative traits that we have in our lives to not be the person God has called us and saved us to be. So let me ask you these two questions as we close. What is, think about this, what is my biggest fear and why? Remember I said that type threes, they fear being, being a failure. They fear of not being recognized. Is that a fear that you have? Do you have that fear? What is your biggest fear and why? Why do you fear that? When scripture over and over again tells us, don't fear. We're still prone to give in to our fears, aren't we? I know I am. And it's not anything in particular. It's just fear of life itself, fear of failure, fear of not being who God had created me to be. And if I'm living the life that God has called me to live, then there's no reason for me to fear it. Because God will guide if I'm following him. He'll guide me even in the, the situations that I don't feel very capable of doing. I have a phone call that I'm, I have tomorrow. Um, a guy that I've never met. Uh, we're, we're on a, a, like a Facebook book group together uh, and it's a private group of like youth ministers, which I know I'm not a youth minister anymore, but I'm still on that, that page for some, I don't, I don't know why, but I'm still on there. And he sends me this <laughs> private message and he wants some advice about, about a situation he's dealing with. I don't, I don't, he said, we have mutual friends, so uh, he reached out to me. I've been in student ministry 20 years. I've been in ministry 20, vocational ministry 20 years. And, um, and can I just tell you, I, I'm a little apprehensive about calling him tomorrow. Not because I don't want to help him, I want to help him. But I'm gonna think, oh, what do I have? What do I have to offer? I don't know what to tell him. And there's some personal things going on with what he shared with me a little bit, but I'm going to have this conversation tomorrow, and, and I'm thinking, and you know why? I'm believing the lies of the enemy that tells me I have nothing to offer. I'm deceiving myself. That's that, that's that deadly sin that he talks about in the book of the, of the achiever type, personality type. 
Now, I don't think I'm God's gift to student ministry. I don't get, don't hear me say that. But I've, I've, I've been around the block a few times. I know I've seen a lot. And I probably do have some things that I could share with him. But boy, in my mind right now, I'm thinking, I don't, I don't know what I'm going to share with him. I'm not an expert in anything. So don't, don't allow fear to keep you from what God is calling you to do. Know that he's called you to do it and he will see you through it. And then the second question is, who am I more concerned with pleasing? Who are you more concerned with pleasing? Are you more concerned with pleasing other people? Or are you more concerned with pleasing God? I think that's something that we probably need to just take home and reflect on. Especially those of us, those of you and myself that tend to be a three, that personality profile. We tend to be an achiever. We need to continually remind ourselves um, I told you, threes don't like conflict. I, I don't like conflict. I don't run from it, not as fast as I used to, and partly because I don't run as fast as I used to. Um, but I don't run from it like I used to. But boy, I don't seek it out either. I had a phone call yesterday. I don't know what it is about phone calls um, all of a sudden, but about somebody wanting me to do something um, and, uh, you know, it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't anything unethical or anything like that, but they were wanting me to, to give in on something. And I'm saying, you know, and the whole time I'm like, I don't want to, I don't know what to say. I don't, I know what I want to say. I want to say, no, we're not going to do that. And I ended up saying that, I mean, politely, I think, um, I hope I did. Um, I didn't lose any sleep over it last night. So I think I did all right, but but still, and it was something minor, but it was still having to say no to something. Even though I didn't want to do it anyways, I had to say no. Don't let your concern with pleasing others cause you to neglect pleasing God. Choose God first, whatever his direction will be for your life and the other things will just kind of they'll fall in place okay let me pray for you